Church, it is so good to be with you all this morning. Good to see you. Uh, it's a rare privilege and honor that you're letting me speak as your missions conference. I'm humbled for this opportunity. COVID has thrown us all a few curveballs, but you guys have flexed very well, and I'm so thankful that you set aside this time for missions. And I hope that it's an emphasis not just for me and my family, but for all the many others that you support, many other missionaries that you pray for and that you've been a part of for, for so many years. I think I would like to speak for all of them and saying thank you. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. Thank you for summer teams. Thank you for letters of encouragement. Thank you for gifts in kind, just all kinds of things. We really looked forward to the missions conferences when we came and have enjoyed them over the years. Pastor John was asking me how long Metropolitan has supported us, and I think it's been about 25 years, so I must have been three years old if I, if I do the math right. <laughs> But it is a privilege to, to be a part of Metropolitan. I want to give you a quick update on our family. Many of you have been very gracious in praying for us, especially this year with everything that's gone on. In this picture, we have three of the kids. I have seven children. And our youngest is Ariella. She's nine now. Some of you remember when she was just a newborn. Uh, next to that is Daniel. He's 12. He's our little engineer. Uh, great mind that God has given him. Loves to invent things. Kirsten is 16. She is a junior in high school, but taking what's called early college, so she's getting dual credit at Calvary University, where Pam and I also went. Not pictured is Matthew. Uh, many of you have been following the story of what happened in January of this year. Matthew was involved in a very serious motorcycle accident, spent 46 days in the hospital in the San Francisco area. Uh, I came back to be with him and actually never went back to Croatia because of COVID and moving and everything. I haven't been back since January the uh, 19th when I left on a plane. So the short story is that Matthew's left arm was basically removed from his body without being removed. I won't go into details, but he was paralyzed. All the nerves and blood vessels were, were ripped out. So he's paralyzed on the, on the left shoulder and down and had it amputated from the um, elbow down. So he's living with us now, has a great attitude, he drives, he finished his what's called UX certification for learning how to make apps and web pages more user friendly. He's looking for work, putting out lots of applications, so he is learning how to live with one hand, which is not easy. We're still working with the insurance company to get a prosthetic for his left arm. So pray for him. In addition to that, we found out when we came back that uh, my parents are declining in health quite rapidly. So we've been down to Oklahoma City a few times, haven't been able to see you all, but my parents live over at Hefner and MacArthur, and uh, you can pray for them as well because things are, are not looking good health-wise for them. So we're back for the next year or two, help get Matthew on his feet, get him settled so he can live on his own, and then with my mom and dad seeing what we can do to help them. So it wasn't what I expected, you know, 2020 is now the new curse word. Everything was going great, and then it went 2020. So not what we really expected, but God is sovereign. God, in his providence, was not at all caught off guard. And I've already seen avenues that he's using this in ways that I never would have expected, although the full picture won't come until glory. So we are reminded of his faithfulness. We are reminded of his sovereignty. We're reminded of his goodness, and we press on. Not pictured also are my other three children, um, Elizabeth, many of you know, she's working on her master's in social work. She works with AIDS patients at a homeless shelter. Her husband's a police officer. Jonathan is living in San Francisco where Matthew was living at the time. He's a software engineer. If you've heard of um, Quizlet, he's one of the guys behind that. And then my oldest son, Timothy, lives in Kansas City. He's actually here with us in Oklahoma City with my mom and dad. Uh, taking my dad to, to his church to be with him because he needs a lot of help right now at this time. So that's the update on the family, and I appreciate that I can share this, and you all know our kids. I think when we first started coming, they were just maybe one and two years old, or one and three. The boys are only about 17 months difference in age, and I think many of you actually remember them, so you've seen our family grow up. We are doing Bible translation in what used to be called Yugoslavia, the country of Yugoslavia in the mid-90s broke up into numerous countries, and so now we've most recently been living in Croatia. Before that, we lived in Bosnia, and we also do work in Serbia. We're doing Bible translation 
for those who are Roma. Some of you that have heard me speak know the history of the Roma, that originally they came from India. They migrated about a thousand years ago to the West, coming through the Middle East into what is now Europe, all the way from Eastern Europe, where we are, to the UK. There are about 95 different groups, 95 different languages spoken by them, and most of those do not have the Bible yet. So my goal this morning is twofold. I want to share a passage of Scripture with you. At the same time, I'd like to show you in a small way some of the questions that we ask and some of the challenges that we have when we're doing Bible translation and some of the fun things we get to learn as we go along. So I'd like you to put yourself in the place of this little girl. I've given her the name Jamila. That's not her real name. But I just want to give you this morning some nuts and bolts of how we translate when we're translating the Bible for someone like Jamila. Now, many of us have been believers for a long time. We have numerous English translations. We have commentaries. We have so much that we can go to. But imagine that your name was Jamila, and here you are in your living room in a small village in Croatia, living with your, there's your dad, which would be on your right, and your grandpa on the left, and this is their living room. And she has maybe five, six years of education. That's probably all she'll get. She doesn't read much. She has spoken her language since she was an infant, but never seen it written before. What would it be like to have a Bible for those people? So let's keep that in mind as we turn to Luke chapter 24. We're going to look at a passage that's very well known. It's the Disciples on the Emmaus Road. Commentator N.T. Wright talks about this. He says it's a drama that has everything. It has sorrow. It has suspense. There's puzzlement. There's a gradual dawning of light, then all of a sudden unexpected action, an astonished recognition, a flurry of excitement. He calls this a spellbinding tale. So I'd like you, if you're able to, to stand in honor of God's Word, and we will read this whole passage to look at the flow of this in Luke 24, 13 to 49. I'm going to use a, a fairly formal or literal translation to American Standard, and I do that purposefully to point out some of the things that kind of trip us up in Bible translation, especially when we're translating for those who've never heard it before. Can I get a glass of water? I forgot to bring my bottle up, if someone might be able to do it. Thank you. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them named Cleopas answered and said to them, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, the th it's the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Thank you so much. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going farther. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it's getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with him. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered there the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. While they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace to you. 
But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Please be seated. Lord God, this is your moment to shine. We invite you to be here and speak to us and show us your glory. Open our hearts like you did. Open our minds, open our eyes like you did for the disciples on the Emmaus Road. We come to you as your children, in need of you as our father, and in need of you as our teacher, and in need of you as our master and our guide. So we give this time to you. Open our, open our eyes and be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. This morning we're talking about the scriptures and the power of God. There's an overarching truth that runs through this passage that you might have noticed as you read with me the importance of the scriptures and the importance of God as he withholds and gives understanding of the scriptures. And we'll flesh that out. So I want to share this morning four truths, and then we'll close with four application points. The first truth, people need to have the scriptures and to hear and respond to those scriptures, thus the need for Bible translation. So let's look at the context for a second. We see these disciples that are walking along the Emmaus Road, this time, it, the story, Jesus has risen from the dead, but most of the disciples either don't know it yet or they don't believe it. So this includes these two disciples. Maybe they had been in Jerusalem at the Passover, and now that the Passover is over, along with many other pilgrims, they're heading home, and their home was in this village called Emmaus. All of a sudden, Jesus come up, comes up to them, and he joins them. They're very, very sad. Why haven't things turned out the way they have? Uh, why didn't things come the way we planned them to be? Just as a side note, 2020, right? Things didn't turn out the way we scripted them. Things didn't turn out the way we would have wanted them. In my family, you don't ask for a, car, uh, a motorcycle accident and an amputation. You don't ask for your family to have to, at the drop of a hat, move across the ocean. These disciples are very discouraged right now. Things did not work out the way they wanted. But let's look at the first few verses, and they set the stage and they give us the context. At the same time, I'd like to point out as we go through, as I mentioned, some of the things we deal with in Bible translation as we seek to translate into these five Roma languages. So we look, very first verse, it starts out woodenly, and behold two of them. Now be honest with me, when was the last time you used the word behold in normal speech? John, did you come down to breakfast and say, behold, bacon and eggs? You know, it's like, that is a word that as believers we only use in Scripture, right? It's a good word, but it's not one that Jamila, the little Roma girl, is going to understand. Literally, it means look. Second person singular, look. Well, I don't think Luke is telling Theophysus, look. That's not the point. The point is it's an attention giver. Remember, most of the time, Scripture was not read at this time. It was listened to. Most people didn't have a copy of the Bible like we have. I have hundreds of them, almost literally. They just listened to it. So you had to, in speech, give what's called discourse markers. Hey, get your attention. So what he's saying is, listen up, Theophilus. So you, even in translation, as we think about this, behold would be pretty literal as a translation, but what it means is listen or pay attention. We have to also remember that when we translate for people like Jamila, the fact is that even when we print out the Bible and give it to her one day, the majority of the people like her will listen on 
YouTube or on Facebook or audio recording. So some of the nice things we can do with footnotes and explaining things in print, even the way we capitalize or whatever, is lost when you go to audio. So we have to be thinking, how is this going to sound when it is translated and listened to? Behold is pretty archaic, but listen or pay attention gets the idea of cro across. So the next thing it says is, now listen or pay attention, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. So let me just look at this for a minute. It says two of them. Well, two of whom? The most recent antecedent is actually the women and the 11 disciples, but we know from reading the context it's not them. It's not two of the 11 disciples or two of the women walking. You have to go up a little bit further earlier in the text where it said, they reported this to the apostles and the others. So in order to make this a little more clear, instead of saying two of them, in some of the translations we're more clear. We say two disciples or even two of Jesus' disciples because the word disciple, again, that's one of those Christian words that are fantastic words. They're rich in meaning. But in Croatian as well as in the Roma dialects, it simply means a student. If I was teaching you and you were in my classroom, I'd use the word student. So if Jamila hears two students even, that can be a little bit tricky. So sometimes it's what we call making explicit what in the Bible is only implicit because we want to be clear. We want to make it clear what this is talking about. So Luke 24, 13, you know, we're only in the first verse and we've already run into to several issues that are a challenge in Bible translation. But let's keep going. It says they came to a village 60 stadia distant. Stadia, I have no idea what that is. You probably don't either. But in English, what we've done is we've said, oh, let's make that clear. Let's say seven miles. That's not going to work very well in Europe where only we American, stubborn Americans still use the imperial system and some in the UK, but everybody else uses what? The metric system. So we say 11 kilometers so that Jamila knows what we're talking about. She doesn't know what a mile is. But if you look closely, you'll see that I've written the word 11, but I've also put it in parentheses as an Arabic numeral. The reason is when you are using numbers, all these Roma that we translate for, they have two languages. They have their mother tongue, which is what they feel in, what they really think of as, as their heart language. But they also know the national language, Croatian or Serbian, because they have to. That's uh, the culture that they live in as well. So it turns out that for many of these languages, they count from about one to 10 in the Roma language, but anything higher than that it goes up to using Croatian or Serbian. So what we have to do, and this doesn't help in audio, but at least in print, if they're stumbling over what the word is written out, we at least have it in numbers. So one of our translations will use Croatian, a couple of them use the Roma numbers, just depending on what the needs are as we work with these five different languages. So it says that, it says, listen, two of them were now, were going that very day to a village. Now, quite woodenly, it says, the name of which Emmaus. I think we have no problem understanding what that means. Uh, we get it, but if I were to, or you were to ask my wife where she's from, where she grew up, and she, she would say something like, well, just, it's a town of Albia, a small town up in southeast Iowa. But if she turned to you and said, um, well, I come from a small town, the name of which is Albia, you'd be thinking, hey, this lady is really weird, or she doesn't speak English very well, because that's not how we express it. It made perfect sense in Greek, and that's the natural way to do it. But when you do Bible translation, if you're too wooden or too literal so that it's unnatural, then two things happen. First of all, the people think, God doesn't speak my language very well because we don't say it that way. Or what often happens is they think, well, he must, he's saying this in a weird way. He must be trying to emphasize something. So you can actually communicate something that's not even there. Because when we say something in a bit of an odd way, it's usually to put emphasis or stress. So we have to be adjusting it to a way that they would use it. So we would simply say, oh, a village called Emmaus, or by the name of Emmaus. Things like that come up in Bible translation all the time. So now we've looked at just one verse, and we've already seen uh, some of the challenges that come in dealing with translating from a language that maybe we're familiar with into one for people who have never heard that language used in the Bible. So it, let's move on. It says, he said to them, this is Jesus' response, 
Let me just back up and say, that I, I should have said, the first truth I just want to emphasize again, people need to have the Scriptures, they need to hear and respond to the Scriptures, and thus the need for Bible translation. Now, Jesus, when He responds to them, says, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into His glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, He explained to them the things concerning Himself and all the Scriptures. The disciples didn't understand what had happened to Jesus, and they were very distraught. But why? According to Jesus, they should have known this was going to happen. They should have known that He had to suffer first. They should have known that the Messiah would be a suffering servant who would then rise and get into His glory only after suffering. In a sense, Jesus rebuked them, probably a mild rebuke, but nevertheless a reminder that we need the Scriptures. Jesus expected the disciples to be aware of what the Old Testament Scriptures said, because when He said Scriptures, obviously He meant the Old Testament. Now, I want to emphasize that because today, sadly, 2,000 years later, 90% of the languages of the world don't have a full Bible. They may have the New Testament, praise God, or they may have parts of it, but they don't have, say, the whole Bible. And that's Jesus' point. From the Old Testament, you should have known this. So even today, there's still a great need for the Bible to be translated into many languages that don't have it. There are actually 2,000 languages that don't even have a single verse. If you look at my display on the back, you'll see what their Bible looks like. It's full of blank pages. So why, this is why we do translation. That's why you pray for Bible translators. That's why you give. That's why you send short-termers and send missionaries yourselves, because the task is not finished. We need to make sure that the Scriptures exist in every language. But that's only half the battle. Let's move on, and we'll see why that's only half the battle in a, in a bit. But first, you have to have the Scriptures in order to understand them. So Jesus says, foolish men. Even something as simple as He said to them seems, seems easy enough. But some things are hard to get across in languages. In these languages, Croatian, Serbian, and the Roma dialects, in reality, every verb already has the subject embedded. You don't need to say he. It's just right there. So in Greek, it's the same way. So you say, well, so what, Todd? I don't care. Well, actually, it makes a difference because Luke, when he wrote this, put in the subject. He said, he said. Well, that's really hard to get across in language because, of course, he said it. We have to have a subject. But in those languages, we have to say something like, he himself said or Jesus said. Some of those little nuances that don't go easily from one language across to the other. So, he said or Jesus himself said, and he said, oh, foolish men. Foolish is a good word, and in English we use it uh, sometimes. It's not really in our vocabulary a lot, but languages have not only denotation, which means what you're talking about, but connotation, what the feeling is. For example, if I call you an idiot or an imbecile, um, you'll probably take offense, rightly so. You wouldn't like that. Um, if I say you're stupid or you're unintelligent, then I'm talking specifically about your, your mental abilities or your, your lack of them. But foolish is a little different, has a different connotation. It's not saying that they were unintelligent or that they were stupid or idiots. It's, it's that they were senseless. They weren't paying attention. They were clueless in the context. They were foolish. R.C. Sproul says when he calls them foolish, he doesn't mean that they were slow in their minds or unable to reason properly due to insufficient evidence. Rather, he's making a moral judgment. The problem was not their rationality but their hearts. They were still cold to the truth of God. So when we translate this, we don't want Jamila to think Jesus was calling people idiots. Um, and in, even in Croatian, the, the standard tr translation is mindless. Hmm, that's not quite it either. It means without understanding, or you might just have to say, you don't understand. You can see almost a bit of exasperation or disappointment. Ah, you didn't get it. How we translate that is a bit of a challenge. We don't want to call them stupid, but we do want to say they were foolish or senseless or did not understand. Now, the next term there, it says slow in heart. Okay, well, that's an idiom. That's a metaphor. Um, did they have a slow heartbeat? Did they have really low blood pressure? I'm not being silly. I mean, when you translate across languages for someone who doesn't know the context, slow in heart, well, you could be thinking of something like that. So, Idioms are very tricky. I started to say he meant they were dull. 
Well, dull is an idiom, right? We talk about knives being sharp to slice vegetables or slice, um, you know, sandwiches or something. It's dull or sharp, and we apply that metaphorically to someone who doesn't catch on. And there, I've just used another idiom, all right? It's very hard to go. In fact, I would, I would challenge you to try to go through one whole day without using an idiom. It's very difficult. It's inbreded in us. It's something that we use all the time. But when you go from one language to another, it oftentimes doesn't compute. There again, another idiom. So heart is idiomatic in the sense he's not referring to the organ inside their bodies that's pumping blood. Now, thankfully, in many, many languages, including the ones we're in, heart does translate well. But you probably don't want to say it's slow. In fact, um, you probably want to say something like dull or without understanding or in the sense of, um, in fact, we had to translate it one way and just say, it's hard for you to believe the prophets. Hardness, slow of heart to believe. So sometimes you have to give up the idiom because, or the metaphor, because by using the metaphor, they might, it might go just right over their head and they say, I have no idea what you're talking about. We would rather err on the side of Jamila understanding. So we have this constant tightrope we're walking. We want to be clear. This is God's word. We can't play around with it or change the meaning or play fast and loose. But if by translating it in such a way that Jamila doesn't understand, then have we really met our goal? Have we really translated it for her clearly? So truth number two, however, I want to move on to. Uh, we've seen that we need the scriptures. But another thing that stands out quite strongly is that people can only understand the scripture when they see that Jesus is its fulfillment. Because it says in verse 27, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. Jesus is the pinnacle of scripture. The Old Testament foreshadowed him, predicted him, told of his coming, and then in the New Testament, he fulfills it. Commentator Bruce Barton says, Christ is the thread woven through all of scripture, the central theme that binds them together. Now, in verse 27, it says, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets. Here, we need, to be, we need to be careful. How do you begin with Moses? Moses has been dead 1,500 years. Well, it's not beginning with Moses. That's implied that what it means is what Moses wrote down. What about the prophets? The prophets have been gone for a long time. So it says when he began with Moses and the prophets, he wasn't talking about the people. He was talking about their writings. Jamila is not going to understand that. So we say something like, beginning with what Moses wrote and what the old prophets wrote down. Again, little things that you and I probably don't even think about. It doesn't even register to us. When you're, and let me tell, say this to you. When you're witnessing to somebody, don't use churchies. Don't use Christianese. Don't use, if you can avoid it, behold and <laughs> slow of heart and being from a village the name of which is, Okay. Just do what you can to bring the barriers down so if they're stumbling over something, they're stumbling over Jesus and his message that he demands repentance and obedience, not because they have no idea what you're saying. So let's be clear that the offenses of the cross, not the offenses of our not knowing how to speak the English language, or in this case, Jamila's language, which is Ludari Romani. So it says, in all the scriptures. You know, that's a good translation. It's very good. But again, scripture. When else outside the church or the setting of the Bible to use the word scripture. But all it means is the writings. It's what it was in Greek. It's what it was in Hebrew. It's what it is in Croatian so, and in Ludari. So, in fact, some of the Roma languages only have one word for anything written, whether it be a book, a letter, or some, a piece of paper you wrote on. So if we translate this super literally, Jesus, beginning, or Jesus showed in everything ever written about himself. Jamila is going to be like, Wow, that was a long walk. I mean, that would take forever to go through everything written. So we have to add a little bit, and we say everything written in the holy writings or in the holy scriptures. We want her to understand what it's talking about. So let me move on there. If you drop down to verse 44, he says, uh, Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was with you, that all things that are written about me in the law and the prophets and the psalms must be fulfilled. Fulfilled is a good word. It's an excellent word. But what do you do when you come to a Roma language that doesn't have that word? They don't. They don't have the word fulfilled. It just doesn't exist. So you have three options in that case. Uh, you can use what we call a loan word. Use the Croatian word, the, the Serbian word that they're also familiar with. That is often what we do if we want to make sure we're, we're being um, as accurate as possible. 
but you always run the risk that maybe they're not going to quite get it because it's a second language to them. Uh, some of them use the word fill, um, which is, they do have a word for that, but that's a little bit off as well. So in some of them, we, again, we just have to be really explicit and say it happened or it took place or it came true. When it says, when it says that all things must be fulfilled, that means they must happen. They must take place. Sometimes it's better to be clear and use simple language. He said, all these things written about me, they had to happen, right? So this is how we, we seek to get across the scriptures. Because we're not interested in simply producing a book and plopping it down on the shelf and say, we did it, we finished translation, good for us. What we want is for Jamila to respond like the disciples did, did at the end of um, chapter 24 where it says, we won't get there, but it says, they worshiped Jesus. That's what we want. We don't want just Bible translation, we want life transformation. You have to have one to get to the other, but you have to be dependent on the Spirit of God to make that happen. And they must see that Jesus is the whole point of it. It's not a book that you read and stick in your pocket. It is life because it points to Jesus who is the fulfillment. John 5, 39, Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that testify about me. So Christ is the message of the Bible. Christ is the goal of Bible translation, that every man and woman, every boy and girl will be transformed into the likeness of Christ. Man, we could go on to that so much more, but let me just share a couple quotes. J.C. Ryle was an Anglican bishop in Liverpool in the UK in the late 1800s. He says, Christ was the substance of every Old Testament sacrifice ordained in the law of Moses. Christ was the true deliverer and king of whom all the judges and deliverers in Jewish history were types. Christ was the coming prophet greater than Moses, whose glorious advent filled the pages of the prophets. Christ was the true seed of the woman who was to bruise the serpent's head, the true seed in whom all nations were to be blessed, the true Shiloh to whom the people were to be gathered, the true scapegoat, the true brazen serpent, the true lamb to which every daily offering pointed, the true high priest of whom every descendant of Aaron was a figure. Let it be a settled principle in our minds in reading the Bible that Christ is the central son of the whole book. S-U-N. So long as we keep him in view, we shall never greatly err in our search for spiritual knowledge. Once losing sight of Christ, we shall find the whole Bible dark and full of difficulty. The key of Bible knowledge is Jesus Christ. So that's a theme that runs all the way through it, that Christ is the pinnacle. People need the scriptures, but they also need to see that the scriptures point to Jesus. Let's go to the, the third point. God, however, must be the one who opens people's minds to understand the Scripture. That's something we saw here several times. Uh, in verse 16, it says, their eyes were prevented from seeing, but then as you move on, it says in verse 31, their eyes were opened. Verse 32, he opened to them the Scriptures. And then verse 45, it says, he opened their minds to the Scriptures. Let's just look at these for a minute. Again, getting back to translation, if you look literally, it says their eyes uh, were, well, actually, the, the, the way it, what it means is they were prevented from understanding. But if you look at it literally, I think I put it here, it says their eyes were held from seeing him. Actually, I actually have the wrong picture up there, but let me just explain it. So, woodenly, verse 16, their eyes were held to not recognize him. Well, you know, if I held your eyeballs in my hand, you probably wouldn't see much. So, yeah, okay, but that's an idiom, but Jamila may not catch that. Holding the eyes, so in Croatian, for example, it's to abridge the eyes or shorten the eyes. That's kind of a weird idiom, but it works in, in their language in Croatian, but in the Roma dialects, they don't have that. So we had to be much more explicit and just say their eyes were kept from recognizing him. We want them to understand what this is talking about uh, when they read the scriptures. So what it says is their eyes were opened later on. And that's kind of the point. If you look, it's interesting, even in the New American Standard, they've masked it a bit. It says in verse 31, their eyes were opened. And then in verse 32, he was explaining, no, it was actually opening the Scripture. So you see this, what's running through this whole thing. First, their eyes are held back, but then later their eyes are opened. Their minds are opened, and that's when the Scriptures are opened. This is something we see as critical and essential in Bible translation. 
We can do all the work that we need to do in translating, and we should. But at the end of the day, it's the Spirit of God who opens eyes and opens minds and opens hearts to understand. Paul wrote about that in, in many places. In 2 Corinthians, he talks about the God of this world that has blinded the minds of unbelievers. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, he talks about God as the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God. And then going on in 1 Corinthians, he talks about being taught by the Spirit that they who don't have the Spirit of God cannot understand what is being said. So we have to remember this third truth, that is God is the one who opens the eyes, and God is the one who has to do that even today as we read the Scriptures. I'm going to move on. Time is running out, but let's remember that we're, for whom we're translating, Jamila, that we want the Word of God to be clear. And the, the last truth is the Scriptures must be proclaimed to all the nations. Thus, we need missions. It wasn't until I was looking at this passage a little more closely that I noticed something that I hadn't seen before. It says that it was written, what? That the Christ must suffer, that he must rise again, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed. In other words, not only was his death predicted, not only was his resurrection predicted, but also that this message would go to the ends of the earth. That was predicted as well. Missions is a fulfillment of God's heart, something that he planned ages ago. God is, and I, I'll, I'll share this quote from Philip Graham Reich, and he says, we see this missionary promise in every part of the Old Testament. We see it in the law of Moses, which promised that God would bless all nations through the son of Abraham. We see it in the prophets who said, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. We see it perhaps most clearly in the Psalms. Psalm 22, the same Psalm that prophesied that Christ would suffer a God-forsaken death, also made this promise, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. And then we find the same global promise in many of the praise psalms. The Lord has made known his salvation. He's revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. So Jesus is reminding us that even missions was predicted in the Old Testament, that this message of Jesus suffering and entering his glory would be declared among all nations. So I'm going to bring us to a, a close here. What do we do with all this? What are the application points? I have four truths I've shared, and there are four application points. The first one is pray. Actually, all of these are pray. Uh, that's what I want to challenge you to. Everybody in this room, if you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you can be a missionary through prayer. Pray these things. Pray for the Scriptures to be translated into all the languages which still need it. And as I said, there are hundreds of them and that many will hear and put these scriptures into practice. The Emmaus disciples needed the scriptures. They needed to have the Old Testament, and they had it, but they also needed to pay attention to it and respond to it. So, but first step is having it in the language, and that's still a task of world missions. Pray that people will see Jesus as the point of scripture. The scriptures find their fulfillment in Jesus. All of it points to him. Pray, thirdly, that God will open minds so that we can, they can understand the Scriptures. All that we do at the end of the day will come to naught if the Spirit of God does not open hearts and open minds to understand the Scriptures. And then, fourthly, pray that this message of Jesus in the Scriptures will be proclaimed to all nations in fulfillment of what Jesus said. Jesus said it had been fulfilled, that He would suffer, that He would enter His glory, and that this message would be proclaimed. So, I speak, I hope, not just for myself and not just for Bible translation, but for the other missionaries as well. Pray for them. Pray in their fields of service that God will move among the people, that people will see Jesus, that Christ will be glorified and lifted up, and that hearts will be opened. Pray for your missionaries. Um, many of you are not able to go uh, due to COVID or due to health or other obligations, but you can definitely pray, and I say that not as a concession, but as a challenge, because without prayer, all that those of us who do go do will be pretty much fruitless. So be men and women, boys and girls of prayer, that God's word would go to the ends of the earth, that God's word would be opened, that people's minds would understand it, their hearts would grasp it, they would see that Jesus is Lord, and that all of this and everything we do and all of it finds its pinnacle in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, that's our heart and our desire that you would be lifted up and glorified, whether it's here in Oklahoma City, whether it's in Croatia, whether it's in other parts of the world. We want 
your word to go forth. We want your word to show people Jesus. We want your spirit to open minds so they see Jesus. And we want repentance and forgiveness of sins to be proclaimed because you are worthy to be worshipped. In Jesus' name, amen.